Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. Why do Korean people... Why are they so insistent about the difficulty of the Korean language? So they always talk about how hard it is. Why? Well, have people ever asked you about English and how have you explained it? The sheer difficulty of English? Because they ask me about English, but it's always specific questions. Oh, really? Or like sort of formless complaints. It's uh -huh. never like, why is English so hard? <laughs> um, more like taking umbrage with the fact that it seems to defy standard grammar and sure, <laughs> stuff sure, like sure. that. Well, I think that... Um, for Koreans, it's a matter of pride. Mm -hmm. I've encountered both types of people. Definitely, if you to a Korean say, um, Korean is too hard, why is it so hard? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the retort will be, actually, uh, it's so easy that it can be learned in a single morning. And that's why one <laughs> of the nicknames for it is, you know, letters that can be learned in a single day. So some people respond that way. I've encountered both types of people. Some people mm -hmm. will say, uh, that Hangul is one of the most, you know, scientific and easiest alphabets to learn in the world, and they take great pride in that. It's always the word scientific. Right, yeah. And then, uh, and it's always that the scholars of the entire world have, with one voice, announced that, <laughs> <laughs> proclaimed that. It's always couched that way. Yes. And, you know, that I would agree with. It is very easy to learn, uh, Hangul. But then on the other side, on the flip side of that coin, you'll have the people who maintain that it's very difficult. I think they're both true at the same, the same time. So I've had, I've had people insist that it's easy when I've said it's hard, but normally they're referring to hunger. Yeah, specifically the written language. Right. Yeah. And then, but, um, I think as we were discussing before, I think a lot of people think it's hard for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. That there are a lot of, um, synonyms or a lot of, similar ways or different methods for expressing the same idea. And in that respect, I think English is actually the harder language mm. just because of the diversity of influences in English. Mm. And in Korean, it's basically just pure Korean and then Sino-Korean that comes from Chinese characters. And then English would be the next on that list. And then a little bit of Japanese. And then two or three words of German, which you probably heard, <laughs> Arbeit, <laughs> which means a, a part-time job, which is awkwardly translated into part-time job. <laughs> so people will often say, uh, I have to go, I have my part-time job later, <laughs> which sounds awkward in English. Yeah. We would just say, I have work. <laughs> Why are you emphasizing the part-time right, of your job? I didn't ask if it was full-time or part-time, <laughs> but thanks for the info. It's, the reason is because in Korean, a lot of times, uh, part-time work isn't considered a job. Uh, like you, I'm sure you know that if you say, uh, or, uh, or, you know, 직업, Jigop is considered a real job. Right. And then that oh, kind of, Samsung. Right. Yeah. Something serious, a full time, lifelong employment is considered that. But mm -hmm. but uh I think that's part of the reason. And then in Korean, that's not considered you wouldn't use the word job for that. So people then when they translate it in into English We'll say part-time job. I have to go. I have my part-time job is something you'll hear a lot of mm. in Korea. <laughs> and it's here in Korea, specifically in Seoul, specifically in Shincheon. I'm coming to you from today on Notebook on Cities and Culture, where I'm speaking with a man who has great experience in both the difficulties of English and the difficulties of Korean. His name is Michael Elliott. He has become well known here by creating videos, creating learning materials, both for English, for both about English for Koreans and about Koreans for Korean learners. Uh, these websites include EnglishInKorean.com and KoreanChamp.com. And uh, let me put this question to you. In, in the most nutshellized way you can put it, why is Korean so hard, if it is so hard? I'd say that um, it's the conjugations of verbs, the different ways in which you can conjugate a verb. I I think from what I've heard, it's second only to Latin 
and the complexity of mm. all the different endings that you can add to a verb. So uh, there's that. Yes. For example, I mean... You if, don't need to use most of them. That's true. Yeah. But if you really want to be able to translate the language wow. or, um, or read the language, uh, you have to know those. Wow. For example, like I don't know how much Korean you want to put on this, but just for a few ex- basic examples... Yes. Like, for example, um, so hada is the the infinitive form of to do, right? But you can say, for example, heo or he or hani or hanunga hamyon, hanunga, or um, hagesseo, hagenni, hashigesunika, and and whatever, hesseo, hashosunika, hanunge otteo, whatever. These are all just different conjugations of the same verb, and I've only covered maybe 20% of them. There's still a lot more than that. I didn't even say handa, right, which is another basic one. And uh, and that's just basic conjugations of a verb. But then if you add on to that all the honorifics, Oh, which, yeah, which I, I understand Korean has the most in the world. Just all the different ways of saying, maybe this is what Koreans are trying to say when they say many different ways of saying this, the same thing. Because honestly, English has, you know, a host of synonyms for every word and every concept. But what Korean, I'd say how that would be applicable is all the different ways you can say it depending on who you're addressing. Right. Um, and what about? Right. Yes. Yeah, so just for example, the way that, um, well, you know, nouns, uh, different, changing nouns to into honorific forms, mm-hmm. that's one thing. And just for example, where are you? If you think of all the different ways, like in English, basically, where are you? Or if you want to be a little more uh, colloquial, where you at? Right? Sure. <laughs> where are you? Yeah. Where you at? Those are your two That's options. Sound cool. Yeah, right. Want to want to bring the street? Very yeah. <laughs> your yeah. two options. Yeah. Dribbling a basketball, as you That's say. Right. Like, say it on the court. One hand leg is rolled up. That's it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Which a lot of Koreans do, by the way. Yeah. I saw <laughs> that in a bar the other night, and somebody said it. Some American said that was middle school style, so we hurriedly pushed it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't want to be accused yeah. of being middle school yeah. style. But, um, yeah, so, but if you think of that, I mean, basically you have the two ways of saying it in English. But if you look at that particular phrase in Korean, mm-hmm. and then you have everything from 어디에 계십니까, mm-hmm. right, to 어디 계세요. So the highest forms when you're addressing somebody who's a lot older than you. So 어디 계십니까, 어디 계세요, slightly lower. Yeah. Then 어디에 있어요, 어디에 있습니까, yeah. and then 어디야, 어디니, and now we're going lower and lower and lower. Yeah, yeah. Till now you're addressing someone who's like a cute little youngster, like where where are you, little boy? Like, you know, the, these, yeah, 어디야, 어디니, okay, all these different ways of saying the same thing. Maybe that's what Koreans. If Koreans are maintaining that that's difficult, I would agree with that. Yes, yes, yes. But to one thing to remember is that's not intellectually difficult. Right. If you take a moment and think Think about it. Oh, I know this guy's 30 years older, so I should use the highest form. I know this guy's about five years older. I know he's one year older. I know he's the same age as me, but we're we're still using formal speech. Whatever it is, it's not conceptually difficult. What's hard is that you have to make those decisions in a split second. Yeah, exactly. It has to be instinct. Right. It has to be automated. Mm -hmm. So once you start speaking informal Korean with your friends, and that becomes... You know, you've got that down. Uh, then the problem is you'll suddenly get in a taxi and speak right. informal Korean yes. <laughs> to somebody who's a lot older. Right. So, like I said, it's just if you take the time to think about what's right, it's not tough. Mm-hmm. It's not tough to, to compute that, oh, this person is 10 years younger, right. so I can speak informal Korean. That's not tough. The tough thing is transitioning between those and not messing it up. Mm-hmm. And I've actually seen Koreans make that mistake where, you know, when you refer to yourself, obviously you're not going to use an honorific about yourself. Mm-hmm. And I've seen, um, for example, like I'll ask a Korean, you know, there are uh, different ways of saying to sleep mm-hmm. and the more polite ways, mm-hmm. right? And the, the more casual ways, just more child, right? right? But I've seen Koreans, like, all ask somebody who's older than me in the politest way, 
I'll say, oh, uh, 주무세요? 주무셨어요? And they'll answer just really quickly, oh, 아직 안 주무, 주무, 주무셨어요? So about themselves, oh, they'll... Yeah. Turn it around. <laughs> right. Which is what we live in fear of doing as foreigners, or right. like anything but do that, right? Right. Yeah, yeah so it's, uh, oh, for example, like, um, you could also say, are you studying in a really polite way? Like, for example, um, like, are you studying? And then you would say in response, no, I'm not studying, but you've ended up using an honorific about yourself. Mm -hmm. So even Koreans make that mistake. They'll end up just repeating what I've said, mm -hmm. uh, which in other languages would almost always be acceptable, mm -hmm. just flipping it around. And then in Korean, it doesn't work. Um, so like I said, I've even seen native speakers make that mistake a few times mm -hmm. um, by just flipping the question around and then end up... Um, kind of putting themselves up on a pedestal <laughs> but then we'll laugh about it. So I think honorifics, I think humilifics, those kind of things are tough. Um, and the conjugations of nouns, just the grammar of Korean is exceptionally hard. Mm. Um, you know how it, people often will say that the word order and the grammar of Chinese is a lot easier. What's hard about Chinese, obviously, the tones, the tones are tough and the characters are tough. In Korean, the characters are easy, and it doesn't have tones, but the grammar is exceptionally hard, and the honorifics and things like that are really tough. Um, and there are even special forms, too, you know, where, um, I don't know if you've heard of hageche or haoche. Like, mm -hmm. hageche, okay, for uh, just if you try to think of how you're going to say you in Korean, and that you... Uh, if you need to say not with a name... Or right. you, which is always a problem. Yeah, you is just a perennial issue in Korean because you is informal and it's kind of taking someone down a notch. But there are a few different ways, like no is the most informal way and you would only say that to a close friend and then there's nega or sometimes people say nega, nega and that's something like that. And then there's Tangshin, yeah. which is more formal, <laughs> but, but still people don't use it, right? Yeah. You wouldn't say that to someone you know, cause, or you don't know, because it's awkward. So normally what you do is have to figure out, you assess what their title is, or you come up with a <laughs> title, and then you address them that way. Right. So if it's a taxi driver, you would say, Mr. Driver, sir, something yeah. like that. <laughs> You're right. But if you don't know uh, what their job is oh, or their yeah. title is, then it's tough. Right. So then you end up um, kind of working around right. that. Right. And then sometimes you'll use um, the honorifics, to make it clear you're not referring to yourself. Right. You know what I'm saying? I still don't know how to how to address my uh, girlfriend's mom, whom I always speak to in, in Korean, but I just have never said... Uh, I've always just started, started talking, talking, like, just about whatever. And that's... Even my girlfriend's like, yeah, just do that. Just but I, it does feel awkward to us that we, all, we have, like... I'll be like, am I closet going? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, and then once you get used to the Korean way uh, and always avoiding you then it's strange to then switch back into English. And, and when you're speaking to someone whose uh, station in life is much higher than that of your own, and then being able to refer to them as you, just right. being able to say that, it's like, oh, am I out of bounds here by calling you you? Not the division manager, sir. <laughs> right, yeah, right. And then I was trying to find a parallel for that in English, and I had always said to my Korean friends, oh, even you know, if I'm speaking to Pres President Obama, it would be okay for me to say you. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that in the old days, um, when you would speak to someone in the royal family, uh, people then would avoid the use of you and say, would Her Majesty care oh, for a walk yes. like that in the third person? Heard that. Right, that's yeah. a lot in a, what is it, Downton Abbey or whatever? <laughs> I'm sure it may, I don't know if the Queen is in that show. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the Duke is, so, <laughs> or whoever. But, um, yeah, so that did used to exist in English. Mm. And a lot of those things, um, once you delve deeply into English, you'll find some parallels. Right. There's somewhere. There's a parallel somewhere. No matter how weird the grammatical right. thing in Korean or another language, English did it sometime yeah. in some way. Maybe right. not today. Maybe, you know, your majesty is just kind of a joke today. Yeah. And it's a pretty useful one. Sometimes you want to take someone down a peg. But, uh, yeah, there's always there's always some equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, that's another thing that I found in my years here is that you can never make pronouncements of 
that doesn't exist, or this is a rule with no exception. Right. One thing I found lingu- linguistically is that there's always an exception. Yeah. And so you kind of have to be aware of that and be cognizant of that. And Korean's that way, and English is that way too. Mm-hmm. You'll learn these rules that you think are fast and always applicable, and then you'll find out um, that they can always be bent or broken. Right. And then at some times, that's the native speaker's privilege. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've probably come up against this wall yourself, that a native speaker can say something that's awkward Mm -hmm. or a little out of the bounds of normal grammar. And people will say, wow, that's an interesting mode of expression. (laughs) And then you try to um, copy that and no, that's wrong. Right, exactly. Um, And that happens too to... Koreans as well. I think part of that is if you're continuing on in these calculated perfect prose mm. and then one expression is yes. a little out of the box, that's okay. Right. That's but the context. Right. But then the problem is like everything all from, wrong. you're all a little iffy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's that's what it is. Korean definitely has grammar for formal situations and grammar for informal situations. But I think English does as well. We just don't even think about it. I mean, the words that we'll see in Time magazine or the New York Times or the New Yorker, compare those to words that are spoken, and there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And Korean definitely is that way too. Um, Mm -hmm. Even, you know, the grammatical patterns and stuff um, that are used in the paper aren't really spoken. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like... News always sounds different, whether heard or whether read. Right. And for example, like, um, you know, hesnika, gumbo hesnika, something like that. The reason is or because blah, 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 blah. But then in Korean, in the papers, it's just hesni. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. The more form, the more formal one has less Let, sounds, right. which that's, I took me a long time to understand right. that. I don't it's know if there's a reason. Opposite. Yeah, yeah, right. you'd, you'd expect it to be the opposite way. And so another one, yeah, right along those lines would be mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when we speak it, we say mm-hmm. But in the paper, it's just hey without the saw. Oh, they eliminate that. So that's another example of shortening it. So I would just say that um, the paper grammar is a little different. Um, but English is the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's always fun in Korean because there's the dichotomy of sound um, between the Sino-Korean stuff that comes from Chinese characters and the pure Korean. Mm -hmm. Just they sound different. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's interesting. Um, And I like I like to explore that, that it's like it's akin to studying two languages at once. Mm -hmm. Whereas with English, you have so many diverse influences that you're not always thinking, oh, is this from Greek? Is this from Latin? Is this right. from Arabic? Is this from could be anywhere? Yeah, Germanic tribal yeah. language. Oh. Is this from Norse? Like, did one Viking say this yeah. one time? <laughs> right. And a lot of times people don't even know the origin of certain words mm-hmm. in, in English, so you're not always cognizant of that. But in Korean, a lot of times, you know, until recently, the papers, all the words that were Sino-Korean, were written in Chinese characters, mm-hmm. and the, only the pure Korean words were written in Korean, much the way uh, it's done in Japan. Mm. But then uh, over the years, you know, then your readership will dwindle because right. <laughs> if you publish all in all in um, just the Korean alphabet, which is easy and easily accessible mm. to the entire populace, that'll automatically be a more popular paper mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's using populist uh, alphabets. Right. And the stuff that holds tight to the Chinese characters will kind of dwindle in readership. So now everyone's all pretty much switched to mm-hmm. Korean, the Korean alphabet. But if you look at papers from the 70s or 60s, yeah. it's all Chinese characters. Uh, everything mm-hmm. that comes from Chinese was written in Chinese characters. Mm-hmm. And then North Korea, you know, has always wow. just used Korean characters yeah. for everything. Certainly no English loan words in that language as well. No. But I have, uh, you've obviously been asked much more than I have since you've been here much longer, but asked many times by Korean friends or just random Koreans why I'm interested in Korea and Korean culture. And I can say the language itself interests me, which is true, but it never seems to be quite an acceptable answer. I'm better off if I say Korean movies, which is as as true, I guess. But was the language itself a driver of your interest in Korea? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and you're right. Usually 
my counterpart, person who I'm discussing it with, will never accept that as an appropriate <laughs> answer. It's not one of the official ones. Right, it's not one of the, the official. You should have just said, like, uh, Winter Sonata or something. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. I think people maybe, you know how it is. Here, a lot of times, things have to fit into boxes. Mm -hmm. And one one box or one stereotype is that you're not interested in Korean or Korean culture. You're just here to teach English for a couple of years and go back. That's one stereotype sure. of foreigners in Korea. And then if you're not, if you kind of can't be designated or can't be stuffed into that box or that stereotype, when you say, oh, I came here because I'm interested in Korean, then the next question is, oh, like Korean wave stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I would also respond, no, it's the wrong answer again, because I'm not really that interested in Korean popular culture. Right. Um, I'm much more interested in traditional culture and the music and um, the architecture and stuff like that, traditional culture. So that, too, isn't one of the um, accepted answers. Mm -hmm. it, it always seems to inspire consternation. <laughs> and, uh, but it's like a change of subject. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and then people will say like, what, you know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, mm -hmm. but two, for people as someone who was drawn to Korea for those reasons too, and you may have felt this, sometimes you get here and you feel that what you're most interested in has been covered by this pop culture avalanche. Right, and yeah. it's hard to find the gems of traditional Korean culture mm -hmm. buried beneath this kind of um, pop culture that is, you know, kind of emulates American rap or hip hop or this or that. Or you were discussing the pant legs. I mean, <laughs> you'll see, you'll see a lot of Korean singers that imitate rappers from the U.S. and like, for example, I remember in the U.S. when leaving the label on your hat was, oh, like, the sure. cool thing to do. <laughs> you know, if you were a cool guy, you'd never break the hat in, had to stay stiff, and you have to leave the label on it. And then in Korea, that became a big thing. Yeah. So then everyone here would leave the labels on their hats and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's that that's all fine and good, but that's not the reason why I'm here. Right. <laughs> you, know? Exactly. It's, you know, it seems like I was thinking about this just walking around this morning. Like, yeah. We, you know, growing up in America, all we would hear was, like, America is this land where there are so many trends and everything is about, like, fashion and what's popular in America. But I realized that we, uh, we understand trends in America through the media. Like, that's how we, we encounter trends in the media. In Korea, especially in Seoul, you encounter them in life, on the street. I see like 10 girls wearing the same, sh the same shirt throughout the course of a day. When a trend, it's fascinating that when a trend is on here, it's on and you, when fire chicken is a trend, it means you're eating fire chicken. It's not, you saw, it's not, you see a lot of commercials. You know what I mean? Like, have you noticed that particular difference? Like it's trends are in the media at home. Trends are in your face here. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely just the scale of, yeah. of uh, the amount of people that are on the bandwagon, whatever it is at that time, that are on that train, uh, just the scope of it is entirely different. I remember when I moved from Colorado to California to Orange County uh, when I was in elementary school, and that culture shock that people in California kind of had trends mm. that wasn't oh, even yeah. really a thing in Colorado. It I was see. always just you wore whatever you wanted to wear, whatever you wanted to wear. It's it, a and, real uh, like Wobagano. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it's different and yeah. uh, a lot freer. Just people aren't that aware of what other people are doing or saying. Right. And then I got out to Orange County and there was a lot of, oh, this is what the cool kids do. <laughs> and that's what the cool kids don't do. Right. A lot of like this line drawing. And then out here, obviously, the scale is just so much, so incredibly huge. I mean, right. just that when something is a fad, then yeah, it's everywhere. And I remember for a while here, it was uh, true religion jeans um, mm. with all the stitches on them, and they're a few hundred bucks, you know. Which are already in America expensive, but here I can't imagine. Yeah, double probably. And and just that, that was, I think, three or four years ago. That was a trend here. And on a Sunday, date day, you know, less during the week because people have to go to work. Yeah. But on date day, just literally almost every couple, almost every couple you would see um, would have them on. 
And I would often I, matching right, deliberately yeah, and the other yeah. parts of the outfit as well. That's right. Yes. And would have these true religion jeans on. And I thought a couple things. One is how can everyone afford those except for me? Yeah. Because I certainly couldn't. And then, and then also like, How'd they get the memo? <laughs> but, but I, I didn't get. Yeah, I didn't get that memo. I was not informed. <laughs> but uh, I guess just because everybody starts, you know, moving in a direction, and it's just this wave, and people are disinclined to go against the grain. In the, in the states, it's much more about going against the grain and. Right. Everything in, in commercials, too, is always about, I'm going to stand out from the crowd. Yeah, that's how the trends ironically get marketed, is this one is different. This one is different, then yeah. it becomes mainstream, and then the different is defined as something else again, and right. it continues through that ridiculous cycle. Here's the oh. thing, really nobody else is doing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right, and here it's more like, here's what everyone is doing. Yeah. You better get on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What would become of you? Yeah, or are you like... From the sticks, or you, you know, in, from a cultural backwater, you don't even know about true religion. You're not Jeans. from the Jibang, are you? Yeah, yeah, right. Which is a, uh, and like I, I mentioned earlier, the word here for tacky actually is chunsurupta, yeah. which yeah. comes from the word chon, which means village. Yeah. So are you like village-like? <laughs> yeah, are you from the village? And yeah, and here, as I say, Jibang which means literally re like a region or something, but it means functionally everything but soul, and also it's condescending. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so just that, that the extent of it and how deeply it penetrates society is on a scale never mm -hmm. seen in the U.S. English education here is often described as a craze. Do you think that's it's describable that way? Craze is tough because I mean that true religion that was a craze because that was one summer and then it was gone. Right, this has and, been a good few decades. Yeah, I think I mean the whole time I've been here, um, Korea has continued to spend the most money on English education in the entire world. So mm -hmm. I think craze kind of sounds like a fad, something mm -hmm. that's in and out, and and English hasn't. The only way I suppose that it would wane would be to see the, if you saw, for example, Mandarin eclipsing English mm -hmm. as the number one language, and that may happen eventually, that hasn't happened so far. Mm -hmm. um, I think English is still considered the ticket um, mm -hmm. to getting a job. And, I mean, I should we should clarify as well, English is considered that ticket, but what they mean by English here seems to be uh, the ability to get a good score on English tests. Mm -hmm. It's I've heard that figure brought out that they spend the most money on English education of any country anywhere, but then it's often followed up by to the least results. Right. I mean, do you, do you see, think that still holds true? Oh, well, I just remembered that was one of the things. After I had worked as a translator mm -hmm. and uh, for many years and had just been here studying Korean, one reason, kind of the impetus for me to start venturing into education uh was when I was translating two articles and one was that Korea spends the most money and the next article was that they had business people who did business in Asia mm -hmm. rate the ease of communication in these different nations in Asia and Korea was dead last. Oh. So obviously something below Japan. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So obviously Not something I mean yeah, I didn't write the article. <laughs> but uh, that was uh, an opinion survey survey that was done of business people in Asia mm -hmm. and so after seeing that, it was obvious that something just wasn't uh, going right. Something wasn't going well here. And so I wanted to, I didn't want to teach in the traditional way, because I know if you start teaching at an institute here, you often are forced to use their materials and teach in their manner of teaching. Both of which get many, many complaints from the yeah. teachers, like, what is this? Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of... Um, like, Parents, parent, parental in, involvement <laughs> um, to the point that it's very detrimental. For example, kids uh, who are in first and second grade and their parents will show up and say, oh, you know, my my niece or nephew is studying Time magazine at their school and mm -hmm. she's in first grade. Why are you just learning phonics or whatever? Yeah. There's and, and that kind of stuff, you know, it's good that the parents want to be involved. Oh but when they force the kids to jump into classes that are too hard right. and uh, want them to debate, uh, you know, 
interest rates and things like this when the kids don't even really speak Korean that well. Why do they think education works in like a magic way in that sense that there's some class that can just wormhole my kid forward to an advanced level of English? They have to know that's not plausible, but at the same time they do do it. Yeah, that's tough. I think there's a lot of uh, keeping up with the Joneses mentality right. here. That, and they care more that the kid is in the class, not that they're learning learning a lot necessarily. Right, and it's a kind of about bragging rights, mm -hmm. being being able to say, "Oh, my my son is uh, debating about Time Magazine, you know, in his class. What is your son doing?" And I think it's, this is what these women are talking about when you see them out at restaurants. Right. In their circles. Yeah, I said actually in Orange County, I went to. Um, we live in Irvine, and I went to the neighborhood Starbucks, mm -hmm. and they were having the the powwow of Korean yeah. mothers. Yeah, there are a great many Koreans in Orange County, yeah. for those who don't know. Right, especially in Irvine, because of the schools. Right. So, actually, it was Panera Bread. I went over to Panera Bread, and there were about 12 Korean women sitting in a circle, mm -hmm. and I'm sure nobody else knew what they were discussing or what it was all about, mm -hmm. except for me. <laughs> I, right. I sat there, I was listening to them discuss the best teachers and yeah. the best schools. You could be uh, eavesdropping as obviously as possible, and they would never mm -hmm. suspect that, 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 right? Yeah. I could have my hand up by my ear. Well, yeah. What was that again? <laughs> nobody would ever suspect. That's right. true. Um, so, obviously, that kind of parental involvement... Uh, is a double-edged sword. You just need to make sure that you don't push your child into a class that's too hard for them and then they become discouraged mm -hmm. and then it has the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I didn't uh, start studying Korean until I was an adult, until I guess I was mm, 19 mm -hmm. at the time. And I I just don't know that it's necessary at such a young age. I think expression, mm -hmm. building a vocabulary in your own language is much more important. And then you understand that there are these modes of expression. This vocabulary exists. Mm -hmm. And then you use that. You employ uh, complicated phrases and things like that. It's like when you speak English with somebody who's older in America, and they use a lot of idiomatic expressions, and they use proverbs and stuff like that. It's beautiful. Like a lot of times you'll hear English spoken in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And first you have to know that that mode of expression exists. Mm -hmm. And then later you'll have the desire to replicate that in a foreign language. But if you never even get that deep into your own language, wow. everything is so rudimentary. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of Korean kids um, start learning English to the detriment of their Korean. Mm -hmm. And I, that's topsy-turvy. I don't think that's the way it should be. They start learning English, which is to the detriment of their Korean, which is then ultimately to the detriment of their English as well. Right. It's this crazy feedback loop. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. And so, Hagwons in general, um, I, I, I don't want to say that I'm opposed to them, but I think that they could be teaching in much more effective, more constructive ways. And so I, I never wanted to be part of a hawan, but I wanted to teach. And so that's when I started the YouTube channel. Right. And have basically, now I have 130, 140 episodes up there, all free. And I, I lecture in Korean, and I mainly address issues that Koreans have. Um, perpetual or perennial issues for Koreans, not basic grammar, because that's already been covered right. since day one for them, you know, yeah. since elementary school. So I try to stay away from that. Also not interested in teaching the test, because it's not real English. Right. If you learn English properly, the test comes naturally. Mm -hmm. But if you learn test English, then you're left with nothing. Right. You may have a high test score, but your conversational English could be at a really low level, and your written English could be at a low level. And you can tell, I mean, I, I meet Koreans who have done well on these tests, and they sort of joke, they joke among each other in group conversations when I'm there, like, you should be speaking English. You're so good at English. And I, they just say, ah, you know, like, oh, <laughs> it's so we stay in Korean. Even though my Korean is crappy, their implication there is I'll, I'd rather deal with his crappy Korean than dare to break out the English that got me a perfect score on the TOEFL, right? Right. I think people need to never forget that uh, test English is different from living English, spoken English, or written English. And we were talking about shortcuts. 
Uh, a lot of times, if you'll see the test, if you take a look at the test preparation books here, they're written like scientific formulas. Mm. And they'll have all the grammar broken down and say, oh, if you have, um, they always say in PP Hyung for past participle, oh, if you have a past participle here and you have this in this position, if you have an adjective, then mm. the only choice would be a noun in this position. And it's all written out um, like a chemical formula. And that is all fine and good for test results, but that's not the end game. The end game is communication. So again, you've di divorced, you've divorced what the, the meaningful result would be. The pinnacle of achievement would be communication. And that's now been separated from the test. Mm. And so it's kind of, um, I just feel that a lot of people thought that would be a shortcut, mm. but in the end, it's not the efficient way. It's not the most efficient way to study English. Mm. And I was never interested in taking Korean um, proficiency exams. I just right. studied Korean. You were studying for the topic, right? Yeah. Just studying Korean because I wanted to, right. and then I ended up translating because I enjoyed it. And I learned colloquial expressions and I learned idioms in Korean and proverbs in Korean because that was my hobby. Mm. And then later, uh, when I after translating professionally for a few years and I looked at the the topic and it, it was it was not hard I mean it didn't seem hard at all it seemed just like what I was doing normally for work right. which was you know translating hard passages and newspaper level of Korean I think that's kind of the way it should be that the right. test should take a backseat to the actual language <laughs> not here right not here at all so uh, that's unfortunate but I don't I don't see any way of really fixing that mm. um, other than doing what subversion you can through videos, for example, if you're Korean, tell me this. I mean, I was going to say Koreans are all, are all interested in learning English, but I wonder what sense you have of how many are interested in communicating in English and how many are really just thinking, this is going to get me a better job. So I'll work through this and then I'll speak Korean in life. Oh, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to read anyone's mind, but I'd say that definitely the majority it's it's about english is perceived as a tool or a path to making more money mm -hmm. um so i think that's why a lot of koreans are perplexed when they see us studying korea yeah. how are you going to make money off yeah. of that how are you going to make money and i was like that wasn't one of my considerations <laughs> i just did it because i was interested in it yeah. and i remember when i i went to thailand um once and it and it was Things were cheap and it was really nice. The people were friendly. The Western food there is really good. And I came back here and wanted to try my hand at Thai. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked Korean friends and they would just say, oh, no, there's not going to be any institutes that teach that. Mm -hmm. I said, why? And they said, well, because it's a poor country. And uh, why would anyone want to learn Thai? Right. And I just, and then I was thinking to myself, well, that may be true, but on the, on the flip side of that coin, like if you're in a part of a niche market like that, you can end up making a lot of money. Yes. So look at every student. Right. I think if you work in a, you know, later when the, obviously there needs to be translators and interpreters who mm -hmm. speak Thai and Korean. And I think there's kind of a lot of times people turn a blind eye to niche markets because mm -hmm. just everything is about doing it one way. There's wow. the right way and there's the wrong way. When fire chicken is big, you make yeah. fire chicken. Yes. yes. Yeah. And um, another thing that's interesting is when people talk about um, Oriental philosophy, they'll point out that uh, I've had a lot of Koreans discuss this with me, that the axis in Western philosophy is about right and wrong, good and evil. And th that it's always that that couple, uh, the binary system, and that here it's an axis of many different shades. Mm. But that may have been true in the past. Mm. But if you see the way it manifests itself now, or that maybe it's the adoption of Western culture into Asian markets mm. that has kind of things have shifted. But if you see the way people act here and speak here, it's very much this is the right way, this is the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn, um, if you want to be successful, you have to learn English and you have to go to one of these three schools mm -hmm. and you have to live in this neighborhood right. and you have to do this and you have to do that. And if you 
differ on any of those. If you say, well, no, you know what? I don't want to learn English. I want to learn Thai and then be the only Korean <laughs> who can interpret and make millions of dollars in a niche market. Then everyone would say, you're crazy. Get out of here. And you'd be laughed off the stage. You know, it's, I, I know that the philosophy that you know, Oriental philosophy points to kind of acknowledging differences and that there isn't just a right and a wrong way. But it's tough to find that attitude in society at large, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't think that that necessarily um, is something that you can easily find in Korean society, kind of acknowledgement or recognition of different ways of going about the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's very much, yeah, and I'm sure you've realized this yourself. It's always about this is the right way, that's the wrong way, there's no debate. Right. They apply, they apply it to themselves. But people like us... Mm -hmm. We could be, we get some leeway on this. Maybe all, we get total leeway on right. this. Too. Right. Another thing is, for example, if you want to eat this kind of food, right. it's the best here. And there's right. no debate. I mean, right. I'm sure you've, you've heard that yeah. a lot. That this. There's 3,000 other outlets with the same thing, but right. this is the one. Right. And, uh, so I think that's kind of what it's about. That just if you have money, uh, no matter what, you're going to live in Gangnam. And I would say to my friends, well, what if you don't like the bustling? What if you, it's crowded, you know, and lying, lying too, that services that area is the crowdest or the most crowded subway. And what if you just don't want to live in Gangnam? And, and my friends would say, no, if you're rich, you live in Gangnam. And I just, no. what, what are we, yeah. <laughs> no, this is no exception. That's like saying if everybody with a certain amount of money in Los Angeles went straight to Beverly Hills. Right. There's not enough space there and it's not to everyone's taste and so on and so forth. But it's just like, no. No, right. you have to go. You have to go there. Right. It's like you have to live in Westwood. Yes. If not, it's like, well, if you have money, what if you want to live out uh, in the suburbs or you want to live in Valencia? Nope. If you have money, you live there. And, <laughs> yes, and, or indeed downtown. Or right. So there's, this is always kind of the experience here is that there's a right way and a wrong way. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of times I think people, like I said, ig ignore niche markets where they could end up being more successful mm. um, just because they wouldn't want to be looked down upon. Oh, and if everybody else, for example, who's rich, lives in Gangnam and studies English, then nobody wants to be the person <laughs> who says, well, I'm going to live in Irusan where I could have a house that's five times larger and still pay less for it. And my kids are going to learn whatever, Cantonese, right. and then be right. the only Koreans who can speak Cantonese perfectly. Just nobody's interested in doing that, mm -hmm. which is weird because in America, that's what everybody seems to be about right. as well. If everybody else is doing that, I'm going to do this yeah, to yeah. differentiate myself. Mm. And um, that's the most obscure thing I can do given right. the context I'm in. Right, and then I'll make that into my identity. Right. Um, yes. There's a lot of that you in a movie. Cling too hard to right. it, probably. <laughs> right. Yes. right. So I think um, some people, perhaps, who have studied started to study Korean, um, kind of were inspired by those motivations in America because right. of what's something obscure that I can do. Yeah. And then I've, I've seen some people that have kind of, maybe that was the impetus for them, was trying to find something off the beaten path, you know, right. to, to cling to. There is that, and I, we've both studied Korean in Los Angeles as well, albeit at different times in different places in Los Angeles. But in those early classes, I remember, 75% of the class was girls who were into K-pop or K-drama. And I don't, the, their ranks really thin out as you go up the scale. I mean, it's, when you get, I wonder who's, who, what, what sort of Westerners get to be left at the really upper, 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 upper levels of the Korean language? You know, what, how, how does it, how does it work in that sense? Who's, who are the real, is it only the people like you who simply have an interest in the language for itself or who's really, who really gets to the top? Other crazy people. Yeah, I suppose sure. just the crazies. <laughs> no, I, I mean, when I was in the highest level, so the easiest level is level one, the highest level is level six, and then sometimes they'll have special levels, level seven, if they have enough demand for it. But, for example, when I was in um, level six, uh, it was just me and then uh, five Japanese women who were married to Korean men. Right. So they so, don't have very concrete reasons. Right. They're lifers because they right. moved here. And Japanese is very similar to Korean, so they kind of had the shortcut on that too. Right. But I remember in the lower levels, it would be 50% 
um, Europeans or, or Americans and maybe 50% other Asians. And then, um, as you go on, it's just everybody, all the European faces disappear. Yeah, they go away yeah. as you go, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, when I'm in Los Angeles studying, it's, it just gets down to Korean Americans, essentially, right. and me, a friend who's married to a Korean woman. And so it's sort of like the, you have to explain yourself more and more as you go along. It's, do people at, at some point they start asking you, when your Korean crossed a certain threshold, were people just asking, why do you know so much Korean? Why did you get to this level? You know what I mean? Right. People seem suspicious. suspicious. <laughs> it's if like, you know 200 words, ah, yeah. no. if you know 200,000, well, there might you, be an issue. Yeah, people, um, it's strange, the reaction. Yeah, like, like you said, I think they really like it when foreigners come here and yeah. learn a few hundred words just to show uh, some respect for the, the country. And I think that's a good idea. But then if you go further than that, I think they're kind of put off by it. I mean, you know, our secret code, right? Yeah. And then, and then, or why, why have you stayed this long? <laughs> you start to, aren't I, you desperate for hamburgers? Right. Yeah. Steaks. <laughs> um, but it, it's like I, I was saying to you, I think that's based in the mentality of there's a right way and there's a wrong way. Mm. And if you're an American who is here studying Korean, not teaching English, right. first of all, that, that's a red flag. <laughs> you're on, what are you doing? What, what is the strain? Let's see your passport. Yeah, when, when, like, when's your visa up? Yeah, I mean, I, I, they don't b believe that you're just here to study Korean. Also, I think the media definitely perpetuates those kind of stereotypes mm -hmm. and really thrives off um, depicting foreigners here as disrespectful mm -hmm. party people. Right. Um, I think that sells <laughs> papers. Think kind of like a slot machine. Yeah. Sense. Yeah, I think that sells papers, yeah. you know, and if they can say, oh, these foreigners come here and they don't care about this, they don't do that, they don't do whatever. Right. I mean, the truth is... I mean, everywhere you're going to have good people and bad people, right. you know, and, and, um, but I think so kind of the, the desire to sensationalize things, uh, is something you see a lot in the media here. Mm -hmm. And, but I, uh, it just, it's not one of the modes or the types of people that they acknowledge like mm -hmm. like i said you can be an army guy and be here and then that makes sense or you can right. be a uh, english teacher and be here and that makes sense it mm -hmm. fits into one of the boxes mm -hmm. but if you say i'm here to study korean then yeah it's a red flag it's like right. wh why why would you want to learn korean right and, it reminds me of i don't know if you've read anything by peter hessler he writes for the new yorker he's written a lot about china he lives in egypt now i think but He's, he learned chi Chinese fluently um, and using st some strategies that reminded me of the strategies, strategies I've read about you using. But in any case, he, he, came, he went from China, between China and Egypt, he, he went to your home state of Colorado, except he was in the rural, what is it, the southwest of Colorado is quite, quite empty. Mm -hmm. uh, he, it's he was, all empty, it's except for Den Denver. Yes. <laughs> but southwest Colorado, I think, maybe southeast. But he, they lived there for a while, he and, he and his wife, and... Uh, at bars, people would ask wh where he would move from, and he would say China, and they would say, "Were you military?" He'd say no, and that would just be the end. They'd mm -hmm. have no more questions. Right. Like they, he was either military or I don't know. Oh, like yeah. what? What do you say when you, when you even just friends back in Colorado? How do you? This these days are I'm sure over. You've explained yourself already, but you know when it first became apparent, you were really driving to learn this language and the culture. How did you explain it to people back home? Well, I'm not the type of person who really keeps in touch with back home. <laughs> that's, that's one thing. So, I mean, back then I was studying music. I was always in music magnet programs. So those people don't even know that I have moved to Korea and the that I speak Korean and I haven't tried to explain it to them. That stuff to me is tiresome. <laughs> Explaining to Americans too why I'm, why I'm doing what I'm doing. When you go to America, you get the question, I'm sure, from just randoms. Denver people usually think it's pretty cool. Denver people are, are always into funky stuff and right. new things, but... Uh, As with any American city versus the rest of the giant country. It's strange, though, because out in Indiana, I always go back for the Indianapolis 500 because my dad's a fan. Mm. And out there, surprisingly, 
if if you say you live in Korea, a lot of people say, "Oh, I've been there too," and it's all military guys. Oh, okay. It is a lot of military guys, and they'll say, uh, "What you know? I don't know. Their term, I don't know military terminology." But they'll say, "What camp were you stationed sure, at? What yeah. battalion or whatever?" Yes. <laughs> say, "Oh, I was actually. Uh, I know I look like a military guy, <laughs> but I'll say I'm, I'm out there doing something else." And uh, yeah, but I think the reception in the states usually has been. People think that's cool, I suppose. Mm. One thing, though... There's something different. Right. You're an you individual. Know, the, whole, the whole hipster thing yeah. is trying so hard to be different, you know, and then... Get your just, mustache at the right angle. Right, right. Getting the beard just the right length. Mm -hmm. And and, and uh, wearing, you know, clothes that are just aged and smelly just to the right level. Right. Which Koreans, I don't think, oh, would that yet understand. That like, try, to, try to explain wearing something ironically. Like an <laughs> ironic gas station attendant shirt. A trucker know? hat. Yes. Not I'm not a trucker, <laughs> yeah, but, but I dress like a trucker because it's cool. Yes. And no, I'm not trying to be cool. Yes. Oh, but wait, yes, I am. Right. I just don't admit that. <laughs> Here's why my sweater is ugly. <laughs> right. I, that whole hipster thing is so tiresome, too. It's so bored. I'm glad I don't have to participate in that. Right. Sometimes that's, that's a, a perk of living outside of the country is that you don't have to play those ridiculous games. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I can kind of be off the beaten path without even trying. I just am. My existence is. Yes. Like living here since I was 18 right. and, uh, and translating and speaking Korean and doing what I've done kind of makes me strange. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to try, which is nice. Uh, You're but outside of American trends. You're outside of Korean trends, so it's sort of a nice middle position. It's it's free, yes. Um, because I don't have to worry about any of that nonsense, which yes. is nice. Because yes. if you have to expend a lot of thought on that, you aren't doing what's important. You're wasting time. Right. Yes. And so I I'm glad that I'm afforded that that I don't have to. And here too, I can dress in any way that I want because I'm just considered a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So anything that I Doesn't wear, count. right, anything that I wear would just be like, oh, I guess that's what Americans wear. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I could wear a cowboy hat and cowboy boots. Yes. And <laughs> American flag shirt. Yeah, stars, and people stars, like, stars. oh, I guess that's in style in America. And it would just be accepted here. Mm -hmm. So as, I mean, people would think, oh, well, you know, he's a foreigner, so mm -hmm. that must be what's popular where he comes from. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of nice. I don't want to be too involved in any team. You know, I don't want to throw my lot in with any team because there's so much baggage that comes from that. And right. my brother lived out in New York for a while and in Brooklyn and just that whole the whole hipster community and the <laughs> Burning Man and all that and all the things you have to do and say yeah. just to be intellectual. Various pieties you have to yeah, adhere to. That's just that's so much thought and energy wasted right. on nothing. Right. Um, and I guess it's what Koreans say when they leave Korea, they when they want to go to America. Finally I'm away from all the I'm away from the ads that tell me to get my jaw shaved down or True. things like that. Yeah, I think it would be even a, a greater weight lifted off their shoulders. Because America, honestly, if you don't want to take part, you don't have to. Right. I think New York and L.A. are the only really mm, trend-conscious places that are really... Uh, that really care about that kind of stuff. Right. I think once you get out into the rest of the country, people are much more just about, I'm going to wear what I want to wear mm -hmm. when I want to wear it. Right. And I'm going to, you know, do what I want to do and be who I want to be. And I think that's nice. And that's, I think, yeah, a lot of, um, Asian people are attracted to that, that particular freedom, mm -hmm. not having to stay on top of trends, not having to, worry about, for example, those true religion genes, like we said, I mean, they were huge one year, and then uh, totally gone the next. Right. Like now they just, nobody wears them now. And I inherently uh, was a fan of their, I mean, I was a fan of their, that that style particularly. Mm -hmm. That that I, I liked that style with the big stitching. But now I, I know that if I wear mine and I was able to finally buy a pair, <laughs> now as soon as you had the money, you're right? And then it was over. Yeah. The trend was over. You're from the village. I know, man. People are gonna look down on me. <laughs> but now if I wear them, people will be like, "Oh yeah, Americans just don't really know about style, do they?" You know, I know that's what they'll think because that style now is a few years old. Oh my. And so there's definitely a little bit of that uh, going on. If you if you try to participate in a trend here or right. anything like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, it's too much work. 
Mm. Yeah. Now you've recently, you've recently, as of this recording, done a video where you're actually out there on the streets of Seoul. What's what's the concept there behind the latest stuff? Well, I had shied away from teaching elementary Korean just because there are so many people already doing it out there, and I wasn't confident that I would be able to do it in an interesting way. Um, because I don't want to go back and teach the basic grammar patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, like, like it seems like it's going to rain. Or, or, <laughs> it's always about the rain. Or rain yeah, right. Or, like, it looks like it rained, you know. And I don't, I'm not really interested in that, going back to that level for me. And um, so I didn't think it would be interesting enough for me to pursue, so I had taught advanced Korean. Mm. Um, but there just isn't enough of a market out there for advanced stuff yet. And so I came up with this way that I can teach elementary Korean in a novel way, which is going out there and teaching site-specific stuff. Mm. So, for example, we go out to the river, um, the stream that runs through downtown Seoul, uh, that's Cheonggyecheon, mm-hmm. and it didn't actually exist when I first got to Korea. There was an up. thing up in two years. Yes, yeah, <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's unenvisionable in America. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, and if they did build it in America, it would be totally covered with graffiti. Sure. And that's and you, if you go down there, you'd get mugged. Right. That would be the American version yeah. of Cheonggyecheon. <laughs> like they <laughs> built it, and then it's like this wasteland. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting to me is more the assumption, less than that it happens but that we assume it will like i had a lot of conversations in japan about the vending machines there because i'm sure you've seen trips to japan they're really nice they're everywhere they have liquor in them i mean they have everything the draft beer one i'm especially fond of yes and every foreigner americans canadians englishmen whatever always says it's always the same thing if those were home they just get beaten up those be destroyed I'm like i just hey. step, i stepped back and i was like why do we assume I, 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 why, why do we assume it will happen it doesn't even make sense that like things just get destroyed if they get yeah. put out well that and that's true one of the things that if you live abroad for a while yeah. you start to be disgusted by the way people um, abuse public facilities in america for no reason like even well, the word public you think yeah. okay it's gonna be dirty Trashed, inadequate scary you avoid it yes uh, yeah, some sad. criminal element to it right i just imagine what asian people must think when they get to america and and see the um the traffic signs or the street signs all covered with barbed wire mm. and they wonder what are they protecting him from <laughs> uh, and it's like oh they're protecting him from the american public yeah. because people will, will find a way to get on there and deface <laughs> anything anything yeah. beautiful and then it's like you'll ride the buses or the subways and everything's just scratched with people's names yeah. and from an asian perspective like if you imagine how asian people must see that they must yeah. get there and if they think oh i'm finally in the most powerful nation on earth the richest nation on earth and then you ride the subway and it's just tagged and trashed yeah. and it's dirty than it was yeah. 30 years ago but. it depends on you know where where you are and i love the la subway i mean that's how i get around now when i get there but the truth yeah. is like if you just imagine what a korean must think when they get there and where are the other 12 lines all right and how come my phone doesn't work yeah and how come I'm getting robbed? <laughs> it's just, I, I mean, I was just in LA for a couple of days and I had some scary run-ins. Uh, but I just, um, <laughs> how do we get on this topic again? <laughs> Soul video. All right. Okay. So <laughs> back to that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we we agree that if something were built like that in the states, it would be destroyed immediately. Well, then we seem to believe that anyway. So. It's just because everything nice is destroyed immediately in the states, and it's sad. And we're so desperate to make our mark on the world that, that doing literally that is sometimes enough. Let's just let's just pull something over. Mm-hmm. Let's pull something down. Whatever. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. So I think that's part of the thing too. Is like in the states you have to go to smaller towns. Like I prefer the the facilities in. Denver are are much better, much safer, and cleaner than in the bigger cities. Mm. And um, I think, too, that's something Koreans also don't understand because they assume that just like, uh, what is it, 80% of the wealth of Korea is in Seoul, they assume that everything worthwhile would be in Los Angeles and I don't, or New York. Or New York, to be fair, yeah. there's two cities. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> or a two-city country of 300. I don't count Hipsterville over there. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, <laughs> I. But the truth is, like, for if you're going to spend a few years going to school in America, I would not recommend L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, just because 
it, it, a lot of times you have to spend a lot of money there if you want to live in a safe neighborhood. In it. But if you live in another city, um, Denver, for example, a little money goes a lot further. And, mm -hmm. and the downtown area there is really nice. The library in, De in Denver is amazing. The art museums are amazing and clean and huge. And if you're a Korean trying to learn English, that's a better city to be in because there's not a lot of Koreans around. Right. I... I just feel like it's unfortunate that everybody gravitates to Los Angeles and New York because of the names, whereas I, th I think they'd be better off in smaller cities, especially for learning languages and staying safe and, and traveling uh, cheaply. But anyway, back to the lecture series. So the site is, is koreanchamp.com, but that's not about me. I'm not a self-professed champ. That's if you want to become a champ. Uh, you can use the site to do so. But we go out and so Chonge Chon and that last syllable Chon comes from Ha Chon, um, which is a Chinese character for stream and it's three, uh, vertical lines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I teach that kind of thing and we go out there and it's convenient too. It's an easy way to teach hard vocab and easy vocab at the same time. Mm -hmm. Cause there we are and I can teach water, which is yeah. mul and bridge is and tari, but I can also teach the Sino Korean word, which is daegyo. Yeah. But daegyo is always used with a formal, a proper name. So it's something, something daegyo. It's never used by itself. And it's just once you're bumming around somewhere, you think of all these things that can be taught, you know, mm -hmm. and then I cross the crosswalk. And I thought, oh, I can teach crosswalk. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the signs, and the sign says there, you know, please don't release your your pets. In the, <laughs> please don't release your turtles here. Right. And then I, I um, see we're about to. Right. And I read those uh, the words there, and those were hard words, like the word um, in Korean for releasing an animal. Mm -hmm. They have a specific word, mm -hmm. which is it says pang mm -hmm. hajimaseyo. So pang that is like to leave. Right. And Tseng is life or biology, something like that, to live. And so it's saying, like, don't, yeah, release wild animals here. And another thing there was Yaseng uh, Dongmul, which is wildlife. Mm -hmm. So it's a cool mix of being able to teach hard stuff and uh, and easy elementary level Korean at once. Right. And it's, it reflects almost how you were learning Korean in those intense years of doing that, studying the easy stuff and the hard stuff at once, doing multiple levels of classes at once. I mean, is that... How you think, do you think of that as a type of language learning method, trying to get multiple levels at one time? Well, I mean, honestly, it was level 101, 102, 103. Right. It wasn't like level 101 and 601 at the yeah. same time. It was just, uh, you know, and each of those levels are a month, would have been a month. So taking three concurrently meant that in one I was the best student or one of the best, and one I was an average Joe, and then in one I was the worst student. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to always bite off more than you can chew mm -hmm. um, because it lights a fire under you, which is nice. Um, yeah, I think you always have to do that. Another important thing, though, is to triage the language you're learning. I think a lot of, and you'll see this with Korean kids as well, People will learn English proverbs or Americanisms that I maybe use once every five years. Mm -hmm. And they should be turning their attentions elsewhere. <laughs> this is not a proverb, but a friend of mine made an illustrative mistake once she, which spurred her on to learn more English. She was, she's good at English, but she once was eating a frozen pizza with some friends and she said that it was exquisite, mm. so that's a good example. Uh, <laughs> well, it must have been really good pizza. <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, that's just the w It's a word that grammatically matches, but this, this just the tenor of it, uh, it's, to it's a total mismatch. And it's the kind of thing that frustrates Koreans, I would think. Well, it's like what we were talking about here, that in Korean, um, people will normally say, mm, He's a... Or, whatever, and, and that is often translated as diligent mm -hmm. but diligent just isn't a word that we use every day in english mm -hmm. we'd say hard worker and the reason why koreans shy away from hard worker is because they think that work means il, yeah, il hada, yeah. which is actually False literally working things. yes and another one like that um is you know mashita, mashita. Mm -hmm. and then koreans will often translate that as delicious mm -hmm. but delicious is very emphatic. Delicious is a few steps up, a few notches up the ladder from, you know, what they're trying to say. We're talking mm -hmm. like Yeah, like, yeah, delicious is like one of the, you know, I think I, I only use that word 
if somebody made something for me right. and I can see they put a lot of work into it right. and I really want to go overboard with my flattery, yes. then I'll say, oh, no, it's delicious. Or if they said, oh, it's terrible, isn't it? And then I'd say, oh, no, it's delicious. That's the only time. Right. I would never, like, go to a restaurant with my friend and say, is it delicious? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's something you hear all the time in Korea. Like, yeah. is it delicious? Or another yes. one, isn't it delicious? Which is rare. We normally say, how's the food? Right. Uh, and then the, the normal answer would probably be, it's good. It's really good. It's wonderful. It's amazing. And if you wanted to go a step further, you would say, it's delicious. Mm -hmm. But normally in English, um, yeah, it's delicious is reserved just for advertisements. Right, yeah. And hokey ones <laughs> at that. Right. And if you go the other direction, you just if you literally translate that from the Korean, an English speaker could think, it just means it has a flavor, mm, not right. soy. Right. Like, so what do I say if I just mean it doesn't have much flavor? You know. So the confusion goes both ways, but ultimately, you know, it's 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 a. You just have to, you just have to listen hard to what people are actually saying, right? Whatever language you're learning, what a native speaker says is what you should be paying attention to. Right, and another thing too, um, along those lines, we said that yeah, bashita. Uh, which a lot of Koreans translate as it's delicious, but is actually more like uh, it tastes good or it's good, um, literally means it has a taste. Right. And then, but in English too, uh, the word tasty probably is akin mm, to that. Tasty yeah, means it has a taste. Yeah. And then is the taste good or bad? We don't know, but it's used in a good sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> be like, say it's tasty. Oh, you mean it's good? No, it's bad. It's just, it has a really strong taste. Yes. <laughs> a bad one. <laughs> but yeah, I think oftentimes, uh, I think in everything we do in life, the most important thing is observing what's going on around you and observing, listening carefully and watching carefully. And people don't want to do that. Oftentimes, people just want to want it spelled out. Tell me how to do it. Yeah, it's like mommy bird, chew up the food and spit it in my mouth. <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want to have to chew this myself. And that's how people are about everything. And you can't be lazy that way. You have to constantly. Be listening carefully and just ask yourself that question, like this phrase that I'm using, have I ever heard a Korean use it? And if the answer is no, then stop <laughs> using it. It's the same as, uh, you know, as Koreans learning English a lot mm -hmm. of times. And it's like every day people will say, it's delicious. Is it delicious? And then I'll ask my students, I'll say, hey, have you ever heard a native speaker say, this is delicious? When you've heard native speakers speaking to each other, because oftentimes their English will be Koreanized from right. years here. But just if you ever watched, you know, an American TV show and seen delicious and yeah, maybe you have, but that's one out of every 10 times. Mm -hmm. Normally, it's just like, it's it's good or it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's much more normal. And is it delicious just sounds awkward. Mm -hmm. And so you always have to be, keep your mind open mm -hmm. to what the native speakers are doing and then try to emulate that. And also, modesty is important in language. Mm -hmm. And to just always be able to accept when somebody says that's awkward mm -hmm. and not let your ego get involved and not say, well, we'll see here. The book says this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The book disagrees with Always you. Temptation. Yeah, and it, because honestly, why would they lie? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when people lie, they have a motivation to lie. <laughs> and it's, why would my friend want to deceive me? <laughs> right, yeah. He's not setting up an elaborate, he's not punking me. Right, yeah. Is he punking me so my Korean gets really strange? <laughs> Chances are he's not, you know? Right. And this is not... We can't the, all be doing that. Right, this is not the Truman Show. You're not the star here. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And you're just another loser. And your friend's trying to help you. And... People always want to think that they're, they're special or whatever. You have to avoid that temptation. You have to be modest. And uh, Koreans, yeah, have to be modest in, when they study English, and we have to be modest about the way we study Korean. Mm -hmm. Just always. And, and two people will say, well, I've studied Korean for two years. I've studied Korean th for three years. Well, it takes a lifetime. Right. You know, and oftentimes... Uh, there are things grammatically in English that we'll find out mm -hmm. are incorrect. Right. Um you know, and and you just always have to be modest. And for example, in English, certain things that people will say that are, are redundant, like mm -hmm. safe haven mm -hmm. or whatever. Sure. Havens are safe. That's what I, <laughs> and other things like that, ATM machine, yes, yes. and on and on and on. And, and for example, grammarians will even say that for free is wrong. Mm -hmm. You just say free, right? Mm -hmm. And so you always have to have your mind open. And when you encounter one of those things, 
you shouldn't be offended. <laughs> you should just say, oh, oh yeah, oh. it's not a personal attack on you. Right. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just the way things are. And, and I think one thing that makes people sensitive about it is the way people correct you. Mm. I've noticed that, um, Koreans sometimes, sometimes it seems will correct with a little bit of a scoff. Mm. I, and I think that, uh, especially, I, for example, don't correct Koreans when we're speaking English unless they've asked me to. Right. Um, because it's not a teacher-student relationship. And a lot of times, you know, they, they may, may or may not want that. And I, we consider that a breach of etiquette right. to just start correcting your counterpart's speech. But right. here, yeah. here it's pretty regular. I yeah. think if you're speaking Korean, uh, even if this is a taxi driver, this is a waiter, this is anybody, mm -hmm. they will go ahead and correct you. Right. Which um, we do, we do want. Though. I yes. want is, <laughs> want may be going too yes. far. Certain times you want that. Right. When you don't want that, Not the grind of every interaction. Right. right. Yeah. Um, because you can't go too far if you're always being corrected. Right. But I am really sensitive about that and, if somebody corrects me, I'll lose sleep over that. Oh, right. But I will never make that mistake again. Yeah. I won't. What I won't do is say, "Who do you think you are?" You know, <laughs> I'll I'll say, "I won't get out my book." We'll flip the table over. <laughs> That's right. Yes. 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 Uh, I'll get out my Korean book and say, "Well, see here. See, that's what I won't do." Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think it's a little bit presumptuous of people who. You know, I'm the customer. I don't know that they should necessarily <laughs> be correcting the the customer. Um, on yes, imagine that in English. Yeah, right. Like you go to Starbucks and you order, and the Starbucks employee corrects your English. <laughs> like that's something that happens here regularly. But no, this sample is free. It's not for, for free. free. Yeah. Excuse you. <laughs> Excuse you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that uh, right that behavior definitely drove me <laughs> to study. Korean harder because I didn't want to be corrected because the truth is yeah if I make a grammatical mistake and a Korean calls me out on it I will lose sleep over it that night and sometime mm -hmm. at times for a few nights uh, that'll be something that really bothers me and I remember times people corrected me eight eight or nine years ago mm -hmm. and the truth is yeah I never made that mistake again mm -hmm. but see that has to be People say, oh, you should just talk and don't worry about being wrong or right. The truth is, if I find out that I'm wrong, it bothers me for years. Uh, wow. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing to you, these people. Yeah, well, they don't. And that's why I, I would hope that they wouldn't do it so often. <laughs> they don't want me to sleep. <laughs> um, but I, that honestly, that behavior really spurred me to work harder. Mm. Um, so that's one of the things too that that kind of you have to get used to here is that people you don't know will correct you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I always ask, you know, if if when we're speaking English, oh, would you like me to correct your English before I do it? Right. You know, and also things that are tricky for Koreans are um, articles. Mm -hmm. uh, the or a or no oh, article yes. at all. I've had many a long conversation about one specific instance of that, you know, right. with friends. Right, right. And those things are kind of hard to define. Right. They defy logic as well. And if you try to explain to your friend, no, in this case, it has to be the. And they'll say, well, we haven't referenced that. This is not a second reference. And you'll say, well, no, but we still just use the in this case. I went to the park. That doesn't mean that I've referenced this park right. before you, <laughs> before right. to you. You know, and, and, uh, but like I said, you just. I went to the conceptually nearest park. <laughs> Exactly. Right. The only park. And they'll say, well, is this the only park in the city? No. It's this, we just call it the park right. and the hospital. Right. Just sometimes we do. And, um, and you just have to let it happen. And, yeah. and speaking of hospital, I mean, we'll often say, we'll say he's in the hospital. That's what we would say. But, um, English people oh, will say yes. in hospital. Right. That's become At university. Yeah. Right. That's become, uh, you know, a phrase that's just an adverb or he's in hospital uh, that's a state of being mm -hmm. and then another another thing <laughs> too is uh for example to go home and i would have to explain that it's not go to home right my uh, koreans will often say i i went to my home or i went to home and then explain oh well actually home now functions as an adverb right. <laughs> and that's hard to explain too but you just always and so like i said when i when the tables are turned, 
and someone's correcting my Korean, I try to just go with the flow right, right. and, and uh, accept what they're saying. Yeah. It's a decent way to handle not just learning Korean, but uh, learning life here in, in Korea, especially in Seoul, which is where we've been coming to you from today on Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall speaking with Michael Elliott, who has he's founded two sites, EnglishandKorean.com and KoreanChamp.com. He teaches English and Korean uh, for free through various video materials, which now teach you Seoul as well, and I'm sure we can look forward to a lot more. Michael, thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. This has been Notebook on Cities of Culture. Once again, I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell, Aidan Nolman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chenupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caraselli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Ferriger, Humberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Themistocles Chacrusis, Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright.